The awe-inspiring ancient city of Hegra, also known as Madain Saleh, close sister of the equally astonishing and cinematically famous ancient site of Petra, is now finally open to the public, able to go and investigate for themselves. We have covered this site, and indeed the gigantic scale of the rock-cut temples, the claimed tombs, and tall doorways to enter these sites. Furthermore, we have covered uncanny similarities found upon rare, unfinished areas of these once astonishingly precisely cut solid rock ruins. In addition to the enormous scale of the stone-cut buildings and the absence of doorsteps, which would have enabled the now average-sized human claimed as having created them, no chance of entering them with ease. This giving credence to the many theories pertaining to these gigantic structures, along with their gigantic scales and their enormous megalithic counterparts found at other sites, linked to by cutting marks previously mentioned, were instead constructed by an ancient, now lost race, far larger than any of today, one capable of these incredible ancient feats. Could these structures have instead of, as so many, as indeed we have postulated, not actually built by ancient man, but were actually made by ancient giants. Not only with the muscular ability to have once lifted such enormous stones into position, such as that of the enormous megalithic stones incorporated into the Great Pyramids of Giza, found within the temples of Baalbek, Gornyashoria, but also almost globally? Could this explain how they were once able to liberate these giant stones from the quarries and bedrocks selected almost many miles from where they were eventually placed with seeming ease? How they were somehow transported, enormous stones high atop mountains, assembling them into the remarkably precise laid polygonal masonry that now drenches the tops of Peruvian peaks? How they once raised the ancient obelisk of Aswan? But I digress. Many have now conceded that the methodology of the Great Pyramids of Giza construction continues to be an enigma in regards to a modern explanation as to how the modern man accomplished such feats. Could this mystery be linked to the cover-up in which many have claimed, and we ourselves encountered, in regard to the remains of this possibly lost civilization, smothered by the Smithsonian? one that we would now perceive as ancient giants? It is a hypothesis which would indeed be a fitting explanation for these mysteries and a cover-up, the stifling of a reason for their continued inexplicability to modern explanation. It is a theory which we find incredibly intriguing. In our previous video, we presented a hypothesis a theory believed by many, one of a now lost or possibly hidden race of ancient giants. Surprisingly, however, recently, although China is seen as an infamously secretive country with many tombs and ancient pyramids of gargantuan proportions rarely aerial photographed, let alone explored, it seems that they have, at last, stolen the archaeological world stage with the announcement of a discovery which we may relish but those whom these remains rest just beyond the clutches of, we would presume rather get a hold of themselves to study and then store away in hidden archives, far from public view, an ongoing effort we have personally read of, dating back to the early 1900s. An ancient graveyard, complete with over 500 giant human remains, has not only been accidentally discovered, but publicly exhumed and most crucial of all, photographed for all the world to see within China. Could this be a retaliatory move with other motives at play? If our previously mentioned theory is true, it would enable man to explain the inexplicably, seemingly impossible size of many of the world's megaliths, and indeed still standing megalithic structures of the world. How a pyramidal, treasury, and many other ancient architectures, lintels, and top stones, often weighing many hundreds of tons, were not only transported from quarries many hundreds of miles, but placed aloft many meters with seeming ease. Furthermore, we have in the past not only postulated 
and have also presented reams of witness testimony and photographic cooperation, still to be found in newspaper archives across the Western world, describing these finds, but also the Smithsonian's efficiency in not only dealing with the matter, but disappearance of any further reporting, thus expiration. This also supporting the reason for lost pieces of the puzzle, which is inhibiting us from unlocking the secrets to the site's construction. Perhaps we may never know the true motivations for such a controversial exposure in China. But nonetheless, the resulting fallout of proof presented for our community is a step closer to the truth. The untangling of a tired and tangled web of lies in which many have weaved. For at the bottom of Pandora's box, there is always hope. Take care. During our research, we have stumbled across countless legends and accounts from history which tell of ancient giants. Not only legends, but photographic evidence and an equal amount of initial newspaper reports of their discovery. This often accompanied with the mention of the Smithsonian Institute's insatiable interest in such finds, and then an inevitable erasure of said finds from future research. Rarely has an ancient giant been allegedly found, with the remains seemingly slipping the net of said institute's attention, making it into mainstream research and an ally's collection before the Smithsonian was able to make said discovery vanish from history. Captua being one of these particular finds, which not only matches the initial claims, but has remained in mainstream historical research. Tales of a two-headed, 11-foot-tall giant are not only corroborated by photographic evidence, but the actual mummified corpse of the giant himself. The initial discovery of this incredible being was made back in 1673, an ogre or two-headed giant is said to have assaulted a party of Spanish sailors, who fortunately overcame said giant with cunning. After trapping the giant, the sailors planned on killing it, fearing repercussions if released. The cause of the giant's death, however, has long been debated, but what cannot be denied is the astonishing remains which eventually made their way to London. The mummy then vanishes from the history books for nearly 400 years, reappearing in 1914 on the shores of the Burnbeck Harbor in the UK. The mummy inevitably became an extremely popular attraction, with people traveling from thousands of miles away to come and peer at this once monstrous two-headed giant. It remained in the public eye until 1959, a rare exhibit which escaped the clutches of those who would wish to hide it with many photographs and other research projects allowed to be undertaken on the giant's remains by Lord Howard. This incredible giant, thanks to the Lord's dedication to said curiosity, remains in existence within the public's domain. An undeniable verification of a lost race of giants, which we have long claimed to have had first-hand experience of in their past discovery. A magnificent 3-meter-tall mummified corpse of an ancient giant does indeed exist, and due to its age and primitive technologies available to said claimed sailors, when initially discovered, the possibility of it being an elaborate stitched-together hoax has been seemingly debunked, but also ignored by mainstream media due to the controversial nature of said finds. Who was Captois? Was he part of a race of beings in Patagonia? A race we have merely seen these remains of? Is the corpse authentic? If not, how is he constructed to such an astonishing detail so far back in history? Cap is undoubtedly highly compelling. Ralph Glidden has a rather interesting story to tell. A story which he continued to tell from the grave. While digging on Catalina Island in the Gulf of California between 1919 and 1928, he found, according to him and numerous newspaper articles from the time, numerous skeletons. But what made his claims particularly interesting, however, 
was the claim that their average height was around 7 to 9 feet. The question arrived at by all those who have heavily researched his story is, where are these skeletons today? Could it really have just been a publicity stunt? Or did Glidden actually, somehow, find the remains of a lost race of giants? Santa Catalina Island, also just known as Catalina Island, is one of the Channel Islands off the coast of California in USA. The Channel Islands holds the title as the location of the earliest evidence for seafaring in the Americas, and also the earliest evidence of humans in North America. Ralph Glidden, who worked on the islands for several decades, was an amateur archaeologist who successfully uncovered ancient burial sites on Catalina Island. From 1919 to 1928, it is said that he excavated more than 800 grave sites from about 100 individual locations around the island. In addition to finding thousands of artifacts, he also stated that he dug up almost 4,000 human skeletons, a claim which has often received a lot of negative attention, many claiming he lacked respect for the dead. However, his reasoning was quite profound. He claimed that there once lived an advanced ancient race of tall, fair-haired Indians on Catalina Island and the adjacent islands. With the male adults around 7 feet in height, Glidden lost his sponsor after digging for almost 10 years, and the general opinion today is that he was just bluffing about finding giant skeletons, with the motive of creating interest and making money. However, he never made much money from his finds and received little financial attention. Additionally, Ralph Glidden was not the first to find a giant skeleton on Catalina Island. According to Pittsburgh Press, July 20, 1913, and also the Daily Telegraph on July 26, a German naturalist named Dr. A. W. Furstenon uncovered an 8-foot skeleton on the island. The skeleton was found with artifacts such as mortars, pestles, and arrowheads all different from the ordinary Indian burials, plus a strange flat stone bearing unknown symbols. Furstenen had, while in Mexico, heard the legend regarding the noble race of giants that had once lived on Catalina Island, long before the white man had arrived. He would find the skeleton along Avalon Bay, in black hard sand, yet, alas, the remains have since vanished. All over the islands, there are countless reports. According to several newspaper articles, Santa Rosa Island was the site of a dig in 1959, where they discovered several skeletons more than 7 feet tall. The tops of the skulls were painted red, and the skulls were described as having sloped foreheads. On San Nicolas Island, west of Catalina, in 1897, a party of relic hunters stayed three weeks on the barren island, and Newark Daily Advocate would subsequently tell of them finding bones of a giant race on San Nicolas Island. Whether these bones finally made it into private collections is unknown. In 1930, Glidden was ready to sell his collection, including his whole series of secrets regarding the island. In return, he requested an annual annuity for life, funding for five expeditions, and the necessary financing for various planned publications that included a large monograph chronicling all of his excavations. But it seems, sadly, regardless of Glidden's confidence, nobody wanted to buy his miraculous finds, and in 1962, at the age of 81 years old, he sold his collection for a mere $5,000. Just six years later, Glidden died. However, in March 2012, an unlabeled box was discovered resting deep within the Catalina Island Museum archives. In this box was Glidden's collection of secret records, among which was, most importantly, a series of unique photographs showing Ralph Glidden indeed excavating one of his authentic, giant, and very ancient skeletons. Have you ever heard of a man known as Og? References to Og appear in the Phoenician inscriptions from Byblos, within the much older Canaanite Ugaritic texts, within Midian on the northwest Arab Peninsula, in Deuteronomy, in the Book of Numbers, and in Joshua. Mentioned in many religious and non-religious texts, King of Basham, which is now the Golan Heights. Who was this Og? Well, it turns out, Og was a giant. A rather special giant. He was, in fact, the last of his kind. The Book of Numbers states that he died during the Battle of Edrai. 
Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 11 declares that his bedstead, translated in some texts as sarcophagus, was made of iron and was 9 cubits in length and 4 cubits in width, about 13 and a half feet by 6 feet. It goes on to say that at the royal city of the Ammonites, his giant bedstead could still be seen as a novelty at the time the texts were written. Fast forward to the present day, and a miraculous discovery has been made. A discovery which could see more biblical stories being proven historically accurate. A recent archaeological dig has unearthed no less than two dozen skeletons, all of giant proportions near the ancient ruins of Rujim el Herai, which is indeed located within the Golan Heights. What's more, compellingly, this was no normal burial. During a press briefing, the team responsible for the discovery expressed their views to the world. Quote, the site of Rujim el Herai has been extensively searched for decades already, but our team noticed a mound nearby, which we thought was of major interest. It has been two long years, but it was definitely worth the effort," said Tom Yagur, one of the archaeologists on site. One of the giants was covered in an exquisitely crafted suit of copper armor. One of their copper swords was also as hard as steel and made in a fashion unknown to modern man. Could this really be the final resting place of the last of the giants? All we can hope is that the Smithsonian doesn't get a chance to buy them. Alaska, America's largest and most sparsely populated state, although that may not have always been the case. We have previously covered many compelling accounts, reports, excavations, even photographs of this mysterious race. It seems no matter where you turn within controversial archaeological fields, you will inevitably come across reports of giants. They even made it to the notoriously remote Polynesian island better known as Easter. Tales of giants with two rows of teeth, giants with red hair, blonde hair, moon eyes, and even giants from Alaska. Just who were these world-traversing ancient Goliaths? Were all these different tribes related? Were they responsible for the building of many of the ancient structures found around the world, where the placement of huge megalithic blocks still perplexes us to this day? Atlan is known as the Gold District of Alaska and James L. Perkinson owned a piece of it. An extremely wealthy American miner who found something remarkable in his land, something so impressive, he graciously went to the San Francisco Call newspaper personally to report his findings. Two weeks prior, the first excavations were being made for a tunnel which unfortunately broke through into a layer of an ancient burial ground. Within were seven gigantic skeletons. One was a mere seven feet in height yet the others were of a tremendously greater stature, some over 10 feet tall. The layer is at a high altitude, and the ground is half frozen, making for great preservation chances," said Perkinson. He believed that many more giants were buried there, as the ones he unearthed were lying comparatively close together. The skeletons were unusually well-formed, but one unique feature was the size of the bones, the forearms were enormous in comparison to usual people. Besides two of the skeletons were spears, rudely shaped and pointed with sharp stones. Other pieces of stone and carved metal were found nearby. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be long before it all seemingly vanished. Regardless, this was a noble act by James L. Perkinson. It is sadly unknown just what did happen to the giants on James' land. This was a report made by James L. Perkinson to, and subsequently reported by, the San Francisco Call on November 18, 1900. Ohio, the United States of America, nearly 12,000 years ago. The Cherokee would descend from Northeast Asia to inhabit the Americas, upon arrival they were welcomed by a race of giant beings. They would become known as the Moon-Eyed People, a race of people far older than humans. It is said that they were responsible for the ancient ruins that now dot the landscape. The Cherokee called them the Moon-Eyed, due to them only being able to see in the dark, during the day they had very poor eyesight. From the book, Old World Roots of the Cherokee, Chapter 5, What Kind of Indians Lived in the Territory of the Choctaw and Chickasaw. According to local traditions, and confirmed by excavations of bones in Tennessee, a race of white giants. 
the Choctaws told of a race of giants that once inhabited the area, and with whom their ancestors fought when they first arrived in Mississippi. It was always believed that these were just stories passed down from generation to generation, the tribe for example had a legend of the Mastodon roaming the Great Plains of America. However, over the past few years the remains of this mythical race have began to surface, confirming the Cherokee's accounts. This story was told by Comanches in 1857, many moons ago, a race of white men, 10 feet high, and far more rich and powerful than any white people now living, inhabited a large range of country, extending from the rising to the setting sun. Their fortifications crowned the summits of the mountains, protecting their cities in the valleys. They excelled every other nation on earth, either before or since, in all manner of cunning handicraft, they were brave and warlike, ruling over the land they had wrested from its ancient possessors with a high and haughty hand. They drove the Indians from their homes by the sword, and occupied the valleys in which their fathers had dwelt before them. The remnants of their fortresses, and the crumbling ruins that surrounded us all, is what remained of their mighty cities. In agreement, the Indian trader Adair often referred to the Nanish Tahuolo as departed white ghosts, vested with spiritual powers whose descendants were priests and magicians. Navajo legends speak of the Starnake people, a regal race of white giants endowed with mining technology who dominated the West, enslaved lesser tribes and had strongholds all through the Americas. The remains support legends of this race of giants having multiple sets of teeth, and having been over 10 feet in height. The remains have been officially exhumed, but alas not officially covered in the press, it is as if we are now at a point of paradigm destruction. Artifacts that tell of such beings are no longer successfully hidden, they are now just ignored. Following, some archaeological evidence found regarding this giant race, they practiced a mother goddess religion, they possessed copper, not bronze, axes, polished slate tools have been found, including fishing plummets, which were apparently regarded as sacred, belief that the grandmother moon was the repository of souls, a diet of mainly shellfish and seafood. The building of fish weirs on North American rivers to trap migrating eels, this is a form of fishing known as elvering, but due to plummeting stocks it is now widely regarded as detrimental to the ecosystem. Certain vegetarian habits, wild rice, for instance, inscriptions on artifacts, especially pipes, often buried with the dead, use of coal and petroleum, weaving and looms, knowledge of seafaring, mathematics and engineering, including canals and irrigation, burying of a dog with a child to guard the latter in the afterlife, a language apparently Afro-Asiatic and close to Semitic tongues, and kingcraft, nobles were buried in seated positions on thrones surrounded by a coterie of their retainers. They also had flatter heads and six fingers and toes. Were these giants highly advanced? Did they build the pyramids? There is also many contradictory tales across the earth, which speak of primitive, cannibalistic beasts, enslaved and used for their strength, yet no legend has ever been corroborated with such compelling archaeology as the moon-eyed people of Ohio. Where these races of giants came from, or indeed where they went, is a question which needs to be answered. It is now a well-known, heavily studied fact that the modern-day bird was once a very different-looking animal, evolution in the form of a radical transformational adaptation, forced upon them by gradual changes in the Earth's environment, from which they once came, that being the dinosaur. We now know this to be fact, thanks to modern technology. Our capability to now scan these fossils some found remarkably well-preserved, still fortunately containing many things which have allowed us to discover that dinosaurs had bird brains, or more accurately, birds have dinosaur brains. With current investigations even shining light upon the reality that many of these gigantic animals, including the T-Rex, once had manes made of feathers. This drastic change from the dinosaur resulting in the vast array of creatures we see today, from the ostrich to the albatross, even to the commonly domesticated budgerigar. Yet they all share one common trait, a significant reduction in their size. Even animals which survived unchanged, such as the crocodile, still shrank considerably. This shrinking of said species, having been demanded of them by environmental changes. Evolutionary adaptation as we have covered in the past, is, in the channel's opinion, in its true sense, an adaptation of specific sets of vertebrate types, the true definition of species, 
not as Darwinian theory posits, of leaps between such. Thus, evolution witnessed within the animal kingdom is not indicative of a shared single ancestry, but inseparable branching from specific vertebrae or phyla groups, never proven to have leaped from one to another. As such, modern-day birds could in fact be seen as the product of de-evolutionary adaptation. This loss of size would in all probability have also resulting in a deterioration in their intellectual potential. This being due to the considerable decrease in brain mass, possibly derived from cataclysm, which deprived them of the resources needed to remain at such gigantic sizes. The reason for this digression is the channel's postulation of this same process, having once possibly occurred to Homo sapiens also. Could this explain why some of the oldest ruins are also some of the most advanced? With many remaining beyond the reach of modern man's ability to understand them, is it possible that man once had a much higher intellect than us today, due to a far greater sized cranium? Simply put, were we once giants, just as modern-day birds were once dinosaurs? Legends and accounts of ancient giants can be found all over the world, also featuring in many ancient religious teachings. Additionally, many of the still unexplained sites of Earth regularly feature doorways many feet, sometimes even meters above that which is required by and for humans of our modern scale. The Terracotta Army, for example, is believed by many independent researchers, including Mystery History, to have been made by a lost civilization, and their average height, intriguingly, is much taller than modern man. Many accounts exist of giants, which share similar descriptive characteristics. Red hair, double rowed teeth, elongated skulls, etc. With many accounts of red-headed giant remains actually discovered and excavated all over the world, yet often all that survives of these reported events is a small news article, regularly noting Smithsonian involvement in said recoveries, yet seemingly and conveniently always slipping away from the public domain. Lovelock Cave being another example, locals tell of it once being the home of a group of red-headed giants, which was eventually blocked and the giants burnt alive, a giant handprint still visible on a rock in the cave, presumably made by one of these individuals during their unpleasant demise. Yet what has to be the most compelling piece of evidence, fortunately still in view to suggest giants did indeed once exist, are footprints found all over the globe, once laid down upon sediment, now fossilized into solid stone. These footprints range in size up to a few meters in length, indicating that humans, at some point in the distant past, may have been even larger than many dinosaur species. This would have undoubtedly given them the capability to have moved the ancient megaliths we often cover, and also the ingenious nature of many of said sites due to a larger brain. Are these footprints proof that we too, just like the modern bird, were once monstrous in size? Yet at some point within antiquity, experienced a similar or the same cataclysmic events which forced a shrinking of our mass over many generations. Could this de-evolution have been due to what titled the axis of the Earth? When our Earth was aligned, did it have the ability to provide and sustain such growth? Once providing a suitable habitat for an abundance of resources, required for the far greater size food chain witnessed during the Jurassic period? We find the evidence to support the hypothesis of giant ancient humans highly compelling.